Welcome to the Indianola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Man, I love God's presence, don't you? I want you all to practice smiling today, so why don't you look at your neighbor and just flash him a big old cheesy grin. It'd be good for you. Now flash me one. Now hold it. I want to preach that way the whole service. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. You know, we've been on a series on, uh, in a series on perseverance and have gone through some of Jesus' parables that, that teach us to persevere in, in different aspects of our faith. And uh, perseverance in the Holy Spirit, in His presence. We, we talked about that that first week of January. And I got into the parable of the, of the ten virgins, if you remember. And then we talked another week about uh, persevering in your saltiness. That was the next week, uh, which was the parable of the tasteless salt. And then last week, I thought Pastor Jared did an amazing job giving us the word. But he uh, preached on the parable of the talents in persevering in our calling and all those things are, are different aspects of our faith that I think we need to be cognizant of, we need to think about, and we need to be um, intentional about persevering in those things, especially in the times that we live. And uh, am, am, I, am I talking too, uh, too much about the times we live? Do you feel like I'm saying that too much? You understand what I'm saying when I say that, right? You feel the same way, right? I mean, there's something that's shifted. And I think it's interesting as we walk into it, and, and, and understand, I, I think this is the most exciting time you could ever live. If you were to get to pick any time that you got to live in America and live the way we live with the freedom of, of religion that we have, that we're going to stand and keep, amen? No matter what happens, I'm telling you, this is an exciting time. It, it's not a scary time to me as much as it is just exciting. And, uh, you know, we have, what, a dozen new babies in this church. We dedicated a lot of them yesterday. We had a couple others come today, I think, new babies. And, you know, Pastor Jared rightly said that, that uh, that's what quarantining does. Um, it produces babies nine months later. But we are, we are so excited about what God is doing. And even if you have a new baby, um, there's nothing to fear for you or for them because God is in control. And I, I'm excited to be alive in this time period. And there's times that I want to go, you know, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind going to heaven and, and letting God just take care of everything. And I, I feel like uh, Gail sometimes, when, and he said, uh, Brother Gail back here, he said a number of times that sometimes I just want to go home and put a gate across my driveway that says nobody entered. I just want to be me and my wife and everybody leave me alone. How many of you have ever felt that way? I mean, if you're going to be, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. We all felt that way, right? He's just honest about it. And... Uh, I, I, I feel that way too, and, and sometimes. But the fact of the matter is, this is exciting times to live in. And this morning, I want to talk about persevering in our commitments to Christ. Everybody say commitment. 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 Deciding to follow him no matter what. Again, we live in a time which I believe anything can happen. Lots of Christians are speculating about the time. Some are just plain freaking out. And regardless of your political views or opinions, this old world is going to end when God says it will end. Okay, just, just let me speak to the, the, the camera a minute here. If you're an environmentalist out there listening this morning, um, we want to respect the earth and everything, but this earth will end when God says it's going to end. That's just the truth of it. Well, global warming, global cooling, yeah, that's God having his fingers on the thermostat of the world, all right? You can write that down because you can ask him later when you're in heaven. He'll tell you, yeah, well, that was true. Pastor Barry was speaking the truth on that. <laughs> the world will end when God says it will end. That day has already been marked down in future history. And you know what? God the Father, he's really good about keeping his appointments. He has perfect timing. So there's nothing to fear. Uh, I believe that the things of for us in this country, maybe things for us in this country may become incredibly tough. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that, but that doesn't take away my excitement level. Financially, it may become difficult. Difficult, uh, might become difficult in adjusting to uh, the decay of our liberties and freedoms. I mean, uh, that's somewhat going on. It might be difficult in the sense of being hated for our faith and persecuted. I need to get rid of this. 
Is it just acting up on me today? I don't know if I can get rid of this. Here, Pastor. Yeah, woo. Is that better? This one gives me the deep voice. All right. (laughs) But in the midst of difficult times, it is imperative that we remember what the Lord has taught us. It's absolutely essential that we go to the word of God for our marching orders and not just fall into every wind of doctrine that comes our way. We need, to be, we, we need to persevere in our commitments to Christ, to, bring, to, be, to being followers of him, true disciples of all that he's taught us to do and be. And, and I was thinking about this word commitment, and, and, and I, I got to thinking about this, this story that I knew of. And I, I love this true story of a 29-year-old American actor slash writer, he was both, who uh, with 106 bucks to his name made movie history. And he did this by truly understanding what it means to commit, something that many Christians could stand to learn a little something about. He concluded early in his acting career that if he was ever going to prove himself, he would have to create his own role and his own script. He decided to write a screenplay that he himself would enjoy watching. He loved stories of heroism and and he loved stories of great love, uh, stories of dignity and and courage and he thought about how he loved stories in which people rose above their stations grabbing life by the throat so to speak and not letting go until they succeeded and so he started writing it and upon finishing nobody wanted to fund its production he felt it was important that he played the main role and the main character in in the story in the in the movie And uh, he would not give in to this point, and it caused a lot of people to pass him over because he wasn't a big name. And even though he was ridiculed for it, made fun of for it, told it would never work, it would never happen, this is going to be a monumental failure, in 1976, he was able to sell the idea, and even though it was a labor of love, and the actors who were not big names either took less money than they probably deserved, Sylvester Stallone got the shot to have his script for the movie Rocky produced which not only launched his career, but it spawned seven sequel box office hits. One of the actors that was considered for the part was Burt Reynolds. This is why they wouldn't do it. They said, you gotta have a guy like Burt Reynolds do this part. Can you imagine the movie, Rocky, with Burt Reynolds? (laughs) I mean, that's funny. And as of 2018, the total world box office cumulative earnings for all the Rocky movies, the Rocky franchise was well over $1.5 billion. And that's nothing to balk at for sure. Uh, But the idea of Sylvester Stallone, a no-name writer, actor, making this happen with no money and everyone telling him it would never work is a testimony to his commitment. Commitment. And I have to admit, those movies, uh, they've inspired me over the years. Not to become a boxer, but to become an overcomer in just about every area of my life. I mean, it's easy to cheer for him as you watch those movies, and it's, easier to, it's easy to put yourself in those movies and say, yeah, I'm the guy fighting, right? Do we do that sometimes? Maybe I'm the only one. But even though those movies are, are inspiring, at the same time, I think the real story of Sly making this original movie happen is even more inspiring. The commitment he had to something that isn't even eternal in nature. A fictitious Hollywood movie. That should pale to the commitments that we have in following Christ. It should pale. The commitments that we have to our discipleship. In Luke, Jesus tells a parable to his disciples that deals with commitments and with counting the cost of following him. It's it's like a three-verse parable, so it's a short one this morning. How many said amen? Would say amen. Short, short preaching by Pastor Barry. 
Luke 14, 28 through 30 says this. For which one of you, and this is Jesus speaking, of course, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who are watching it will ridicule him, will begin to ridicule him, saying, this person began to build and was not able to finish. And I, I want to stop there for a second, and I'm going I'm to hang out just with that portion, that little parable right there. But I want to give you some historical context to what Jesus is talking about, because as I, as I read things, I ask a lot of questions as I read the Word of God. I hope you do too, because you can get a lot of answers that way. And one of the things as I read this, I was like, okay, why, Jesus, would you randomly pick a tower to build? I mean, have anybody ever thought of that? I mean, why would you just say, well, if you want to build a tower, how many have ever gone out and just built a tower? It just seems like an odd thing to say. Why not a house? Why not a shed? Why not a dwelling place of some kind? Why not something, a tower? I mean, were towers common then? Did everybody have their own tower? It just got me thinking. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, and some versions actually say house, and I, and I wonder if those versions don't say house because they're like, oh, tower seems so random, why would he say that? The original Greek there really is tower. It's tower. So I, I got thinking, why, why is that? And I, I began to dive in historically of why Jesus maybe said those words. And there were some recent events that had occurred in Jerusalem just prior to Jesus saying this. And these events do bring some clarity to how the disciples would have heard this parable. You know, there's this thing that when you're listening to somebody talk, and this is really good for if you're married or if you have kids or if you're dealing with people at work or at school or however you're dealing with people, to get the phrase down really well, what I hear you saying is this. What I'm hearing you say is this. Because how many know, and I know this all too well, being a pastor preaching to this many people, people hear what they want to hear. Well, remember that Sunday when you said this? No, I didn't quite say that. You're taking that out of context. You're not hearing my heart. And please hear my heart when I preach, folks. Please hear it. But get that phrase down. That's just a good phrase to know. What, am I, what, I, what I'm hearing you say is this. That's a great response to somebody, and it creates communication. I talk about that a lot in pre-marriage counseling. Historically, Pontius Pilate, we know the guy. We know him for being the governor over Ro the Roman providence of Judea during Jesus' time. And he was the one who oversaw, of course, the trial of Jesus. And later, under the pressure of the Jewish people, he ordered Jesus' crucifixion, right? Pontius Pilate. But Pontius Pilate was involved in other activities of historical significance as well. And I think it's, it's important that we don't overlook those, especially in reference to understanding why Jesus set a tower. He built... Pontius Pilate did, an aqueduct, a Roman aqueduct, that brought water from nearly 22 miles away into the city of Jerusalem. He did this using the Corbanos, which was the sacred treasure of the Jewish temple. I think that's really interesting. And you can find this stuff not very easily, but I have a book called The, the Complete Writings of Josephus, and he has a lot of church history in there. Josephus is where I get a lot of this information in his book, but it's historical stuff. It's not scripture. But he used the Corbanos, which was the sacred treasure of the Jewish temple. Can you imagine a government occupying a land, taking the church money, and using it for public use for, for different things within the community? That's exactly what was going on, politically speaking. This, of course, caused an uproar amongst the Jews. They were taking, robbing, basically, the church treasury, if you will, the Jewish temple treasury. And it's caused rioting. Tens of thousands of Jewish men assembled and cried out against him, against Pontius Pilate, pleading with him to quit these designs and the promotion of such a project. Some yelled insults at him and acted in a way that, that uh, protesting crowds often act. And as I was thinking about this, I was saying, man, I've seen a lot of that kind of stuff on TV lately. Isn't it amazing how, how the Bible is, is so relevant for today? So Pilate ordered large numbers of soldiers. This is what Pilate did. He ordered large numbers of soldiers to dress like Jews, like the Jews. And they carried clubs under their robes. 
They surrounded these protesting Jews and then ordered them to withdraw. And what Pontius Pilate was trying to do is he was trying to say, look, uh, we're going we're gonna to get our clubs, we're going to surround them, and then we're going to scare them out of here so we can continue finishing this aqueduct. And the fact that uh, Pontius Pilate was making aqueducts, that, that is historical fact. Okay? That, that is historical fact. I want you to know that. So... As he's planning this to get the Jews out of there, he's not thinking about what might happen. He's not necessarily counting the cost, so to speak. And um, what did happen is things got out of hand. Uh, they surrounded them, they ordered them to withdraw. When, when the Jews refused to withdraw, things got crazy. The soldiers beat them with their clubs and many Jews died while others were wounded. But it ended, it did end the uprising. On a later occasion, Pilate provoked another uproar by doing the same thing. This time, the water was brought from even further. It was another aqueduct, and the sacred treasure was spent again. I mean, the guy doesn't get it. He robs the church, and he makes them all mad. And, and you got to understand, Jerusalem at that time had a lot of Jews in it. That's where the Jews were, all right? And so it, it ticked them off. You're taking our sacred funds, and you're using them for your public projects. Plus, they were being taxed to death anyway. That, I can relate with that. <laughs> so he does this again, and the people get very angry, of course, and they form a ring around the tribunal of, of Pilate, who was on a visit to Jerusalem on this occasion, and they besieged him, and with shouting and angry rhetoric, uh, you know, yelling about and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but here's the thing, Pilate kind of anticipated this was gonna happen, and he had prepared a little bit. He had interspersed within the crowd an entire troop of his soldiers, and they were armed, but disguised once again in civilian clothes. Many Jews died that day, they were beaten to death by the soldiers, and many even died as a result of being trampled to death as their fellow Jewish brothers who were, you know, trampled them as they were fleeing for their lives. These aqueducts were important. You have to understand this. They were very important within the Roman Empire. And the accomplishment of building them would have been a real source of pride for someone like Pontius Pilate, anyone who would have been in power or in position of authority, like a governor position like he was. But these uprisings also... Uh, although he anticipated them somewhat, they were never handled well. In both instances, like I said, things got out of hand, more out of hand than he wanted. Soldiers were more brutal than, than he expected, and more people were killed than he imagined. And this would have been an embarrassment to Pilate. It was a mark on his record as a competent governor who could keep those he governed under control. It didn't look good for him. It was bad publicity, if you will. There was also a time, and Jesus mentions this, and I'm getting to this tower thing. Are you following along with me here? Jesus mentions this in Luke 13. It's actually the only place that we have any information about this. There's no historical documents about the tower that's mentioned in Luke 13, and we're in Luke 14. But it, he talks about when a tower in Siloam fell and crushed 18 people. Jesus talked about that. And there's a whole thing, there's reasons why he talked about it. He taught lessons through that and whatever. But this morning, I just want to make mention of it because it, it, it plays into why Jesus said the next chapter what he said in a man building a tower. There are no, again, there's no historical documents that mention this tower or, or why the tower was built or what the tower is for. Siloam was an area just outside the walls of Jerusalem on the south side of the city. Many scholars have deduced that this tower, which again was mentioned by Jesus in the previous chapter 13, could have certainly been a part of that aqueduct system and probably was a part of the aqueduct system that Pontius Pilate was constructing. So a tower of this importance falling because of its mismanagement or poor planning would have also been an embarrassment to Pilate. Who, who had he put in charge anyway? I mean, what, who, what was he doing? Did he not pick the right people? Was he not good about taking the right gifts and talents and, and, and putting them on projects and administering all that? I mean, he obviously put someone who was incompetent to count the cost of building such a tower. It fell down as they were building it. 
Maybe they took shortcuts. Maybe they fudged on the foundation. Maybe they were building for pride's sake. And so it was impressive on the outside, but very poorly constructed on the inside where it counted. So Jesus is, is actually using current events at the time to teach a lesson about commitment and discipleship. And it's a lesson that has rang loud and clear throughout the centuries of Christendom. As Christians, I mean, I'm not, I'm not into building towers, are you? We don't build physical towers. But just as someone who is building a tower should count the cost before building it, we should count the cost and consider if we are prepared to handle what we're signing up for. when we become a Christian, when we become a follower of Jesus, when we become one of his disciples. Pilate didn't count the cost when he spent the Jews' sacred treasure, which caused them to riot. He didn't count the cost when he planned to dispel the protesters with the soldiers, who were very brutal, as I said. He didn't think about the things getting out of hand, so many people died in the process. He didn't count the cost when building the tower in Shai, Sil Siloam, and it, it ended up falling and killing 18 workers. But are we any different as Christians when we sidestep counting the cost, when we sign up to be followers of Jesus, when we sign up to be a follower of Christ, when we become a Christian, when we ask him into our life, do we just do that flippantly, or do we really count the cost? A good question to ask is, do, do, do we accept Christ because it's a good idea, and it's nice to have fire insurance? Do we accept him into our life because it gives us a group or a community to be a part of? Is that all it is? I mean, being a part of a church has its benefits, right? It's awesome to have friends it's, and, and those that will encourage you and even be there for you when you need them. And Jesus knew that we would need this. But, but if that's the only re reason that we're so-called Christians or disciples, if that's the reason we serve him, is, is that okay? I think there's more to it. This parable is not an easy one, church, because it contradicts our Americanized view of Christianity and being like Jesus, who is so welcoming to everyone, and he loves everyone. Everyone likes nice Jesus. I said that earlier today. But we don't like thinking about tough Jesus. Not tough, rocky tough, physically, even though I'm sure he was. But tough in the sense that he asks a lot of his followers. He expects a whole bunch. We just read Luke 14, 28 through 30. Do you know what Luke 14, 26 through 27 says? The two verses before that? It says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That is not nice Jesus. That's tough Jesus. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's tough words. And sometimes I think when we read stuff like that in the word of God, we just skip over it. But the fact of the matter is Jesus said it. And you can't pick which things you like that Jesus said and which things you don't like. You've got to take it all. And you've got to hear it, and you've got to think about it, and you've got to meditate on it and, and get to that meaning of what it was. And of course, Jesus wasn't really saying, hate your family. He wasn't saying that. This is hyperbole, obviously. He's exaggerating to get his point, he's exaggerating to get his point across. He's not asking them to literally hate their families. He's just saying that in comparison to how much his followers love him, true followers, their relationships with their family should seem that much less. Not bad relationships, just less than the relationship that they have with him. And understand, people come to Christ and decide not to become a disciple. If you can make heaven by just coming to Christ and not becoming his disciple, is, that's, that's for you to figure out with Jesus. I, I'm not going to try to jump into that. But it does say, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, brother, sister, blah, 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 cannot be my disciple. Well, maybe you can come to Jesus and, and not be his disciple and make heaven. I, I'm not going to stand on that thin ice. Because I think Jesus is looking for followers that, that go for broke, that lay it all down. Becoming a disciple requires much of us. Not in earning our salvations, because we can't earn that. 
Jesus paid for that in full. But our responsibility as a disciple is great. And before you just flippantly say yes to a life of serving Jesus, a life of truly following him, you should consider what costs are involved. Is there anything that you put above him? It's easy to say no, but then you live, but then live in a way, even if you say no, live in a way that, that, that screams yes from the top of your lungs. I think about the apostles of Jesus and what happened to them. They were all pretty much martyred or, or at least severely persecuted, beheaded, hung upside down on crosses, all sorts of things, filleted, alive. We may be coming into a period of time where the persecution of Christians within our own nation is on the rise. I, I don't know. No one really knows what believers will have to endure until the rapture happens. I don't know how bad it will get for believers. It may be pretty extreme. It may not be. But there have been many who have endured persecution unto death already in this world. And I don't think God loves us more than he loves them. Well, that wouldn't happen in America. God loves Americans. What would you do if somebody lined up your family and said, deny Christ or they die? I think it's a fair question to ask ourselves, to be prepared for that. Well, God would protect me from that. He's a good God. He is a good God, but he hasn't protected others from that. Their, their, their martyrdom, the persecution of the church, the killing of saints, the spilt blood of believers has always watered the church and the church has grown because of it. What an honor it would be to die for the name of Christ. Not saying that would be easy. Not saying I'm asking for that. But what an honor. And if it comes to that ever... And I'm not saying this because of who's president. Don't, don't get mixed up about that. I'm saying that because there's been a shift. Not in politics, but just in, in the spiritual realm. I, I feel it. I don't know if you feel it. Do you feel it? Yeah. I think we do. I mean, I don't know how many people have said, I don't even know what to watch or who to talk to. I don't even know how to find truth anymore. I don't know what's true and what isn't. I'll tell you what's true, the word of God and it alone. So get in the book. Like never before, commit to that. That's part of being a disciple. When it comes right down to it, the cost of discipleship, it's your life. If you want to count the cost, it's your life. Definitely. Your relationships, your possessions, your positions and status, your dreams and ambitions, but it could even mean your physical life. The apostle Paul knew it. He said in his letter to the church at Philippi, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Folks, that is the church age. It's the same age we're living in. Nothing's changed since then, spiritually speaking. Of, of, of what we're, we're, in the, we're in the age of grace. We have a chance to win as many people as we can. It's time to stop worrying about all of our stuff and all of our possessions and all of our things and all of our relationships and, and, and our, all of our own dreams and, and, and all of our own opportunities and all that kind of stuff, that me, 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 me thing that just permeates Christianity, especially in America. It's time to stop worrying about all that stuff and start worrying about the fact that we have neighbors who need to know that Jesus Christ died for their sins and they can have a place in heaven if they just receive him as Lord and Savior. It's time, church to rise up and be committed to being a true disciple of Christ. A disciple, a follower, a dedicated follower is what that means, disciple. To have that kind of perseverance in the midst of persecution to have that kind of commitment to the cause of Christ. Wow, God, God, raise up Pauls within our midst. We need some Pauls. 
Those that do not shy away from being your true disciples, Lord, but will stand firm and proclaim the gospel no matter what is done to them. John preached the gospel to his persecutors while they were lowering him into a vat of boiling oil. And he began to preach and preach and preach, and then minutes had gone by, and he's in this vat of this pot of boiling oil. And you can imagine the pain, the excruciating pain, but here's the thing nothing ever happened to him. So they got him out of there quick because everybody watching was like, whoa, this guy's telling the truth. He's not even being harmed by the boiling oil. See, God protects, doesn't he? He can. Sometimes he doesn't. You can ask him when, he get, when you get there why he chooses one and not the other. That's up to him. Our job is just to persevere in our commitments, period. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 13 says, Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that part again. Yes, and everyone... Turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Boy, that doesn't sound like nice Jesus. Verse 13, but evil people and imposters will flourish. Sometimes we see that. Psalms is full of David crying out, God, why, don't my, why are my enemies so blessed? Why? Why does it seem like they have everything and I have nothing? It goes on to say in verse 13, they will deceive others and will them themselves, and they and will themselves be deceived. Counting the cost in, in, in our commitment to being a follower of Jesus involves planning on finishing the race. I know it doesn't look like it, but I used to run cross country. I was I was pretty good, not because I was physically athletic or that I was really strong or in, 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 you know, in, in my, I didn't have the right body, honestly. I, I, I was thin, but I didn't have really that, that strong physical strength probably that some runners do. What I had was a really tough, stubborn mind. And that helps in long distance running. I don't know if you know that. But when you stick your head down and you're just going to run because you're going to run, you know, you just do it. I would always think about finishing the race. I would always visualize finishing the race. I do that in my walk with Christ. I, f I visualize what's it going to be like when I finish my race. I hope you do. I think that's something we should do. We should know how we're going to finish. We should plan it. We should prepare for it. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Who are looking for it. Who are longing for it. Man, what will Jesus say to you? What will he say to me on that day? Have you ever thought about that? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. How many know he's going to say that to you? A couple of you know that. That's great. How many, how many of you, keep your hands raised, how many of you also that know that ever wonder by how you act sometimes, ooh, will he really say that to me when I blow it so bad over here? Because I'm not going to walk in there going, <laughs> put my Bucky Beeper badge on right here, you know? I was a good boy. I think what's going to probably happen, and I'm going to be like, there's going to be some fear and trembling. I know we are supposed to enter boldly into the throne room of God, and it's not because of what we've done. I, I understand there's a whole lot of theology here. that, But when I imagine it, I'm like, I think there's going to be a humility like there was with Isaiah. I'm a wrecked man. I'm unclean. He's going to say, wait a minute, you accepted Jesus Christ. His blood cleansed you. You are righteous to me, son. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. That doesn't mean I get to live however I want. Trampling on the blood of Christ. Sinning however I want just because I know I can ask forgiveness. It means that, 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 that idea, that thought that he will look as, at me 
as righteous that he'll look at me as righteous how is that possible that he'll look at me he'll look at you as righteous all the things he knows every thought you've ever thought everything you've ever done and he's going to look at you as righteous because of what Jesus did for you he's going to see righteousness because you'll be quote unquote covered in the blood of Jesus that's why we say those kinds of things persevering in our commitments means our daily actions do not bring shame to the name of Jesus you know that parable that Jesus said he goes everybody will walk by and see that you didn't prepare and they'll think what a joke who's the guy that tried to build that tower same's true for us when we are working at our relationship with Christ as we are living for him every day as we are being committed to him persevering in those commitments our daily actions they they shouldn't bring shame to the name of Christ that's that speaks to how we conduct ourselves in public how we spout off on social media how we dress how we talk the things we purchase the crowds we hang with the activities we engage in all of that comes into play 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you have been bought for a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. He's purchased us, folks. And I, I bring that aspect of it up because the love response that comes when you understand that he has purchased you, that he has purchased your right, his, his righteousness for you, so you have righteousness through him. The fact that he did that makes me love him so much that I don't want to live my life any way I want to live it. I want to live it for him. It's a response to what he's done for me. You die for me, I'll live for you. We make so many plans, but when your life is not your own, God's plans may get in the way of your plans. That's okay by me. God, mess up my plans and do your own thing. I'm not going to just sit here and wait and try to steer a parked car. I'm going to drive, but if you want to go over here, I'll go over here. If you want to go over there, I'm going to go over there. And I'm going to pray that I don't miss it. When we've counted the cost, we can understand that his plans for us, aren't, aren't, they're not optional anymore. Yes, you'll always have the choice, but you, you have to do the right thing when, he, when he's literally purchased you with his own blood. These parables of perseverance are incredible reminders to us especially in the times that we are living in. And don't kid yourself, it, it, again, it's not just another switch of political power within our nation. There's, there is definitely something deeper going on. There's been a shift that has occurred in the basic ideologies within our culture. You can feel it, you can sense it, you're gonna start seeing it soon, I have no doubt. And you had better know where your, loyal, your loyalties lie. Is your citizenship in heaven first, or is it still here on this earth? Is it easy to say it's there, but, but, but is it, it's easy to say it's there, but is it really? I mean, what, what would a true sold-out follower of Christ, one who is fully committed to being a disciple of Jesus and all his teachings, what, what would they be doing right now that is different from what we're doing? What if one of the 12 came back? What if John, who was boiled in oil, he didn't die, but then they exiled him to the island of Patmos where he received a revelation from God and wrote it down and it, was the book, it became the book of Revelations. Um, what, if he was here right now, someone who was so close to Jesus, what would he be doing different than what we are? I think that's... I, I know we should say, what, does, what would Jesus do? I get that. But sometimes, to put it in context of, of our own humanity, it, it, it's interesting to look at some people who, just like us, did some pretty outstanding things. How do you bring the gospel to the world without any media, television? The mode of travel was boat and camel. How do you do that? 
And sometimes the church can't even do it in reference to walking across the street. It's a question for all of us to ask ourselves. Let's, this, this question of, will I persevere in my commitment? Will I count the cost? Will I, will I build this thing called Christianity within my life and within my home and within my family in such a way that I'm not an embarrassment to God? Because it's real and I'm all in. That's what he was talking about. Pontius Pilate, this, this, you know, when he was talking about a tower, I think he was referring to that tower that had just fallen that he made mention of back in chapter 13. It was an embarrassment to Pilate. I think when the disciples heard that, they were thinking, wow, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. He didn't count the costs. We have to count the cost, church. What did you sign up for when you became a Christian? I hope, I hope you knew. And if you didn't know, maybe you know today. What did you sign up for? I signed up to give him my life. End of story. He can do with it what he wants. How about you? Can he have your life? Can he have every aspect of it? What are you holding back from him? What are you worshiping instead of him? What have you made an idol out of? I want to give him my whole life. I hope you do too. Let's pray. And I'm going to ask this question. If there's anyone in here that maybe has never given their heart to Jesus or maybe they've given their, you've given your heart to Christ and, but it was just because you felt guilty for a moment and nothing really ever changed after you gave your heart to him. Maybe you wanted him as your savior so you could escape hell, which is a real place, by the way. But you're not willing to really give him your life. I, I don't know what the scenario is for you. I don't know how you came to Christ. I don't even know how you came to be here today. I don't know if you're listening on, online today how you ended up there. But it doesn't matter. I, I believe God has you here for a reason. And I want to ask you this question, just real simply. Are you committed to Jesus Christ, to being a disciple? Have you counted the cost? And if you want that kind of commitment, let's pray together today. If you need to make a commitment in that way that you've never made before, or maybe you have and you just need to recommit, I, I don't know what that all means for you. Again, everybody's situation is different. I'm not going to try to lump you all together. Your journey is your journey. But if that's you today, and you fit any of that, would you just lift up your hand and say, yeah, I want to commit. Because my commitment level maybe hasn't been where it should be. Or it's been lacking a little bit. Anybody else? Anyone else? There's hands very shyly going up all over. We don't like to admit that, do we? I'm not talking about being committed to church. I'm talking about being committed to Christ. No matter what the cost. Your life. Anyone else? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much that you love us with an everlasting love. God, I thank you once again that you died for us and paved the way made it possible, God, for us to experience eternal life in heaven and to avoid eternal death in hell. Lord, I pray right now that you would help us to just reach out to you and make you our Savior. We, we declare you as that right now. In our hearts, we say you are our Savior. You are our Lord. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We say, God, take the controls of our entire life and drive and steer wherever you want to drive and steer. Lord, we will, we will follow you as committed disciples no matter what comes. Lord, I pray that all fear would be dispelled for what might, the future might hold. Because, God, we know that no matter what, you're going to take care of your kids. That doesn't mean we might not go through some stuff. But you'll take care of us and give us the ability to go through anything. 
And Lord, we just again praise you and thank you for visiting us today with your presence. We thank you again for dying on that cross so that we could be righteous in God's eyes. We love you, Lord. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.